This is Let's Be Clear with Shannon Doherty. Hey, I'm Shannon Doherty. Welcome to another episode of Let's Be Clear. Today, I am joined by a very good friend, producer, screenwriter, and film director, ooh, James Golden Bresak. I'm sorry, I had to I'm say, like, like, ooh. <laughs> I know, I'm just, I'm also laughing because I'm like, you know, you're... I'm like, I'm, I'm Shannon's friend. I guess I do all these <laughs> other things, but I'm like, you know. I know, I but know. you do do all those other things. I know, things. but it was, it, was, it was weird hearing you say it. It was like. <laughs> it was I like, know, because. Yeah. I mean. We did, we did Blood Lake when I was 21 years old and I turned 32. Wow. I, I turned 30. So we're talking 11 years. I can't believe we put up with each other for 11 years. I know. And we've only had like one significant fight. What was the fight? When you left me in the middle of the desert. <laughs> you deserved it. No, I didn't. And it was a joke. It was, but it totally like went a little further than funny. But well, for you. Totally, totally. For me, I, I, I kept myself laughing you totally, the entire yeah. time. I know you were totally laughing. It, it's it, basically what I remember is like I was I was driving you home from set. Right. We were in Arizona uh-huh. and you were we were driving down this like road in the middle of like okay, the desert back way up. It was yeah. for a movie for a movie. Yes. A movie that I was producing that you were acting. And in. what was it called? I don't even remember. Something about the devil. Yeah. Something about the devil. Um, and, and I played the devil. You played the devil. Yeah. And uh, some people right now are like, well, that's fitting. <laughs> and I'm like to those people, I'm like, just but- turn it off we we had this like playful dynamic the whole time because we were friends and stuff and and you know we were joking around a lot we were playing you know we we rewrote the script together to have some add some comedy to your role and stuff and i remember we're we're, we're driving back i'm driving you like we're in the middle of like no there's no like lamp posts there's no like lights or anything it's like the desert no it's, it's like flatland desert. it's where you go to bury someone yeah for sure you're just like i'm tired of you driving i'm gonna drive and i was like okay and so, like, you, you hop out of the car, I go to, like, walk, and you just, like, bolt. Like, you run, like, as fast <laughs> as you can, like, like fire drill over to the other side, hop in the car, and just take off. And, like, I'm like, <laughs> very funny. And then you just kept driving away. Because <laughs> it wouldn't have been funny if, like, <laughs> my taillights were still in view. I had yeah. to make sure the taillights were completely out of view. Yeah, but, like, it, it went completely pitch black, and I'm standing there <laughs> for, like, a solid minute going, like, well, maybe I should call her. And, like, no service on the phone. I'm, like, look at the phone, like, 3%. I'm, like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm, like, oh, this is where I die. I'm, like, That's all right. hysterical. I know, I know. I, yeah. Three hours later, mm. she comes back. Mm-hmm. left me there i mm-hmm. learned it was know, not three hours it was, like, it, it was like it was two like two minutes it was like five minutes yeah like but it two. felt like three hours yeah it was like- <laughs> yeah <laughs> next thing you know you'll be saying that there was like coyotes howling there was there and then was. all of a sudden you were like circled by I a actually pack be- of like wild I be- wolves i was and- accepted into a wolf pack and that was how I survived. That makes sense. It was, yeah. Okay. See, your screenwriting <laughs> skills are coming into play right now because you're literally rewriting history as we speak. Exactly, exactly. But it, it was funny. It just went a little further. Than funny. But I think that that whole experience had to go a little bit further than funny. For sure. Like, yeah, I know. You know, we were there in Arizona together. You were the producer. And I basically said... Yes, I'll do this, but only if James is also my assistant. <laughs> yeah, so I worked as your assistant the entire time, which pretty much just like involved driving you to and from set. And I remember the one time we stopped at uh, like you, you always wanted to go to this like taco shop. Yeah, and like I I, I woke you up while we we're in like the drive through of the taco shop, but it's like we were like driving back, and you look up and you go Los Betos. You like read Los the sign, betos. and you like you got you got like uh, so you got so, so excited. excited for you, Los Betos. Yeah, you got so excited and then fell asleep before we actually got the order out of the the window. I know, but then yeah. you would always wake me up, and <laughs> yeah. I would I would yeah. polish off those tacos. Yeah, yeah, you totally <laughs> but we were you know driving home at what time? Well, because we were shooting like nights. overnights. Yeah, it was overnight, so we were like coming home like as the sun was starting to come up. You know, like it was like five, you know, it's like this ungodly, like vampire hour of like making movies, what you do when it's like a horror thing. It's I think that was a very fun project for the two of us because we had a lot of leeway. I mean, you as a producer and just because our director, you know, trusted both of us. So, yeah, Perry, uh, Perry passed away. Yeah. uh, last, Last year. So we were able to 
rewrite and then write stuff. And so we would sit in the trailer and just write. And we were like cracking ourselves yeah, it was, up. It was like our own writer's room. And then we like started to like crack ourselves up, but we were like, are we laughing because it's funny? Or are we laughing because like because we're delirious it's 3 <laughs> and it's like, no, it's like four in the morning. And like, I remember you'd be like, just come up with something funnier, James. I was like, I got nothing. And then we would go to the set yeah. and tell them, we'd be like, just keep the camera rolling. Yeah. Don't even like, worry <laughs> about like lines and responding to her. Like just keep the camera rolling. And she's just going to say a ton of different things. And I would, I would just like roll with it. Yeah, and, totally. then, and then you would throw like on the spot, you would think of something else and you'd be like, say this. I'd be yeah. like, blah, blah, blah. I'm hysterical. also wondering like if it was as funny as you think it was. I don't know. Cause I still haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. The movie's it. not out. It's By the way, it's, yeah, I've like a hundred years. Yeah. I've asked Anna's dad a million times Jamie, for it. Yeah, and yeah. This on the podcast, we're asking him now. Jamie, Jamie <laughs> if you do not send me this movie, but we want yeah. every take, we want all the takes that I'm in. Takes. Yeah. I'm going to call you out hardcore <laughs> because the listeners want to. Like, yeah, they need to see They need, they need to, to see, see you they dressed up as the it. devil. Yes. Yeah. I actually loved playing. Like, yeah, it was Because fun. there was just a lot of yeah, it was just freedom. Silliness. It was it just was silly and free yeah. and, and awesome. But we met, as you said. Yeah. However many years ago that was, 11. Yeah, like uh, a week before we started filming Blood Lake. Right. So I yeah. got offered this movie, Blood Lake, which was not the best script in the world. It was about killer eel lamprey things. And yeah. one of them goes up Christopher Lloyd's butt. So right. I, I'm, it I'm was, pretty sure. <laughs> it was not great, <laughs> but it was a good paycheck. And yeah. I was like, I'm going to do this. And also I love working with like young up and coming directors now <laughs> did you up, always Jim. did you always yeah you did okay yeah, yeah. i mean christopher landon yeah. burning palms like yeah absolutely yeah. um that was a good movie so we met at christie's, christie's. yeah but restaurant. it was like the, it was old, the christie's. old location yeah, with long staircase yeah so it was it was part of this like motel hotel Holiday in, say what? <laughs> and um, and it had all these. I, I mean, I don't even know how many stairs to get to the restaurant. Like it's a hike. Like it was. It was like a real staircase. Yes. It was giant. Yes. So um, we went there. Yeah. And had dinner to meet. We had dinner to meet, and like I was nervous because, like you know, this is the first time I'm working with like an actor that is like had like I had heard of. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, like, no, it's you're, my you're first like, SAG. Oh, she actually has a resume. Yeah, it's my first SAG movie. You mm -hmm. know, like, it was the first time I was working with, and, and also I was warned by, like, everybody that you were incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, this is, like, what I'm going to deal with. Yeah. Like, okay, like, let me be prepared. So, like, I go and I sit, and, like, I meet, like, the sweetest lady, and then and then you show up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I meet the sweetest lady. And no, no, no. Like, you know, me and you both like sat there and we both agreed like, OK, this is a nonsense movie. Mm -hmm. But like, how do we make it better? And we sat there like, you know, coming up with how to make it better and like how to like add depth to your character. And I feel like that relationship, you know, that we had on that very first day of like, you know, hey, this script is not great. But how do we make it better has carried over into every project we've done. I agree. Because every time I do something, I mean, granted, we do better scripts now, but <laughs> every time, you know, me and you always have a conversation of, well, how do we make it better? And that's part of why I love working with you so much is, you know, you like to push me and you like to help me find, you know, much more depth in the project. And and I feel like... And vice our, versa. Exactly. And I think like, you know, working with each other, like we, we push each other. We try to find more and we don't like to just you know, settle. And I think that's, I love that dynamic. Yeah. And it's never critical. Like we're never critical of each other. It's always just no. like, we were a little critical this, of eels going up people's butts. For but, sure. But, but that was the eels <laughs> that we were critical of, not of each other. Yeah. But there's, you know, that idea that people have. And when you meet a like-minded person of like, okay, I have this script in front of me, but can it be better? Can we make something that's super silly and ridiculous actually? And find like the heart of it. Yeah, as well. find the heart of it. And I think like, you know, it, I'm, I'm still proud of your performance in that. I think you give like a very believable performance in a ridiculous movie. Thank you. Um, and 
you kept it grounded, which I, I, I really appreciate. Well, you were a big part of that because you were very much as a director, like, listen, the more like subtle we stay, the better it'll be. But if people are going into hysterics over these eels, eel lamprey type yeah, things, this, this, like coming out from toilets and like yeah. showers and Which like- we also didn't even know like how many were going to come out. Like, yeah. it's like we were acting like, oh, it could be like 50. It could be like one of one, them. One, right? Yeah. Like we're like, you know, we didn't know what the, the visual effects budget for that was going to be yeah. like. It was like- you so know, you it, kept it very, you kept it grounded. You know, yeah. as a director, you kept pretty much everyone very grounded. Well, I think, you know- but that was that was that was awesome. And the first time, you know, we meet, you know, at the very end of our meeting, which I know you told me that I couldn't tell this story, but I have to because it is the it is the best you story ever. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, at the very end of the meeting, after we had this lovely meeting of talking, you know, you give me a hug and you go to walk down that giant staircase and you trip and fall down the entire staircase. <laughs> And I'm standing at the top of the staircase and I'm like, oh my God, did she just die? I mean, it's like 40 stairs at least. <laughs> like 40 stairs. And you're laying at the bottom of the staircase and I'm like, oh my God, I, I just killed Shannon. Like, did I hug her wrong? Like, what just happened here? And you just like look up like this and go, I meant to do that. And like scurry off. And I was like, okay, I'll see you Monday. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was so embarrassed and humiliated. All I could think was like, I, I, I like, how do I literally crawl to the car so and get home? When you got up though and, and did that and you're like, I meant to do that. Like in my mind, I was thinking like maybe she did because like there was that whole conversation during dinner where you were like, you know, my stunts in this aren't that bit, like bad. I, I probably do. I, I can do my own stunts. Yeah. I can fall. Yeah. And so I was like, Maybe she, oh, was, maybe, I was, maybe, uh, she maybe was. Maybe I was auditioning. <laughs> yeah, as my she was own like, "Hey, person. look, I can do the stunts." I was like, "I don't know what's going That's on." Hysterical. I was like, "You know, for sure." It was only until like you know day three of filming, you were like, "Yeah, no, I totally did not mean to do that." <laughs> like when I had bruises on yeah. my body, and I'm yeah. like, "Oh, that that hurts a little bit." Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. It was, it was fun. Silly. So one of the things that I love about you, it, it was. Uh, you know, kind of reminiscent of like Quentin Tarantino that he and and a lot of directors, honestly, I mean, Martin Scorsese, right, works with like Leo, Leo Leonardo DiCaprio um, all the time. And there are directors that, you know, hire the same people over and over and over and over again. And I love that that about you, um, A, because thanks. <laughs> thanks. You give me jobs. And I really like that. I mean, uh, you give me amazing performances. And, and But one thing I love about working with the same people, especially working with, with you, is is every time you work with somebody, it's like you're learning their language. Every person in, in entertainment and in, in a creative art speaks a different language. And so when you learn that person's language and you know how to communicate with them and you become like that, you, you become family and you work together and you do this, why learn that with somebody else? If right. you have that there and you built upon that, why not continue to build upon that? Well, yeah, because there's like a trust, you exactly. know, that's well, so built that now you can tell me to do something, you know, completely outside of the box and well, like silly. And I trust you with like what you're telling me to do. And I'm like, OK, this will well, probably work. And I think that trust went both ways. in when we did Bethany, because I remember right before the first day of filming on Bethany, you had like gotten the cancer diagnosis like or, or like that week and you had called me. And I was on and I and just started meds. meds. Yeah. And you were like, I'm not sure if I can do this. Yeah. And, and I was I, worried. And I told you like, look, like if, if you can't do it, like we'll figure it out and we'll we'll I'll get somebody else. But I think you're going to want to take your mind off of it and, and do it. And, and if you do, like I'll send you the call sheet, you'll be there. And if you don't show up, I'll know that you can't do it and, and I'll get a replacement. Don't worry about us. And you showed up and you did it. And I remember there was the one time, because I guess the meds were messing with you a little. You had that one speech that you had to give that was all about, you know, when you were uh, looking at your face in the mirror and it's yeah. all about like beauty and, and I mean, stuff. it was a it was, weird speech to was, begin like, yeah, with. Yeah, it was like a it, soliloquy like, type yeah, thing. Yeah, and it, it, the way but, that it was written, it didn't yeah. like come out. And then I think I was, obviously it was, literally a week or two weeks after yeah. getting diagnosed, just starting meds. My, my brain was like on overdrive thinking about cancer and For like, sure. what does this mean? And you know, what, what are like the next steps? And then all of a sudden you get this 
you know, monologue that it's, really makes no sense to you, right? Yeah, because it, it, it's, it's a super intense monologue and it was long and, you know, you're supposed to be looking at your face and touching it and And, and I have crying. a photographic memory. It, so you like do, lines 100%. are never you're like, you're a like problem. Like that. With, yeah. So it, like the, the meds were messing with you in that moment. And I remember, you know, you were like, I, I'm not going to, I can't, I can't get this down. We, we talked about like what the meaning of the monologue was. And it was like, you know, about like lost you know, youth yes. and, and, and how you no longer saw that beauty in yourself. And that's why you were projecting it onto your child. And, you know, the depth of that. And then we talked about, you know, that story from uh, when Francis Ford Coppola was doing The Godfather 2 and De Niro was looking at like the baby and he had this whole monologue he's supposed to be saying to his son. And he says, I'm just going to do it with a look. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say this monologue. I'm just going to look at the baby and all my hopes and dreams that I want for this baby is going to be in the look. And Coppola trusted him and he did it. And sure enough, he did it with the look. Yeah. And so we talked about that and and you were like, I'm going to do it with a look. And you did it with the look. You, you look in the mirror and you started crying and you didn't have to say anything. It was all it was all on your face right there. And I think that really showed trust on both of our sides. I, I think, agree. To be able to have that moment. I thought that was like where we really... We had done many projects before together, but I felt like that's where we really like click clicked, if that makes sense. It Yeah, it totally makes sense. And, and it's, I, it's, I think it's actually one of like, if I just take that scene and put it on, you know, I don't have a website, but if I did, you know, <laughs> I would put it there as like a moment that I'm really proud of as an actor. I would put that on because I felt like it was, I think it's much harder to convey as an actor everything only through a look. The, the words help you convey it because it's obvious. It's it's very obvious to the audience like, oh, here's what I'm trying to say because I'm using my words. I'm also using my face, but there's words to help back it up. And this was when you when you can only rely on conveying with your eyes and like your emotion. Yeah. I think it's much more. Well, there was such authentic, raw vulnerability God, yes. you at that point in your life as well as in that moment. And I think it really shows on, on screen there and, and capturing that it was it, I would say one of my proudest moments as a director. So, and you only made me do you know, it like 20,000 times. 30 times. 30, 30, <laughs> no. I don't remember no, how many you times. Did it, it, you did it on the first take. Yeah, what are you talking it, about? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, we've done a lot. So we did yeah. Blood Lake. Borgor's music video. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, we did Bethany. We did. We did the double movie. We did the pilot. We did a pilot together. I yeah. forgot got that yeah we did a pilot together which turned out pretty good what was that called again i forget it i was, forget too it was about rock and roll yes so we did that yes um and then we did the bruce willis movie the mel gibson movie the van damme movie the bruce willis movie um was called the fortress mm -hmm. that also was a really kind of fascinating experience for me and i just remember this scene with him that was written one way it was written as I'm a general and I'm an actual bad guy. Yeah. And, and he's the good guy hero as Bruce Willis always is. And it was just me sort of saying, you know, this is, this is how it works, buddy, essentially. And in that moment of filming it, Bruce and I had a very different connection. Yeah, you both started crying and held hands and like kind of changed the dialogue, which became yeah. like this very raw moment. Uh, that found like the humanity in both characters and you, you found it as like a person who was struggling to do like you, you wanted to do the right thing, but you had to do the wrong thing. Right. And it created a, a much more layered character, somebody that was conflicted and that didn't really want to hurt, you know, Bruce's character. You were just having to. And I think, you know, we explored that. Like that was what was fun. And we were just like, let's just roll with it. Like, you know, I, we didn't go, okay, let's go back to that. It's like, okay, the energy's there. Like, let's roll with that energy. Let's, let's find that. Yeah, but that's also, you know, you know a testament to you as a director, because a lot of people I think would, it would throw them off and they would say, no, 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 that's not the direction. And this is what the movie is about. And this is what your character's about. And instead you are, you're like a very fluid director in the sense of, you're happy to see what a person is feeling raw in that moment and explore where it takes well, us. The thing I, I, the thing is, is I feel that like you, you don't want to fight what somebody's experiencing. You know what I mean? Because then it, it, it feels disingenuous. So find the, the, the genuine moments with the person. What are they feeling? What are they feeling that day? Because everybody comes with whatever they're experiencing and that's there and, and, and utilize that. And beyond that, 
I think that like, you know, a good director doesn't always have to have the best ideas. It's why you're surrounded by so many brilliant people. You just have to recognize good ones. And so being able to be adaptable and, and utilize the tools that everybody brings you and, and say, okay, I can do this, this, and this, and I combine these to do this. Like that's, that's the way I look at it. It's a collaborative medium. It's a living, breathing thing. It never, it, it evolves as, as we make it together. If not, I would be doing every job and playing every role. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's it's I think it's, you know, and obviously I'm not an actor. So <laughs> but I think, you know, finding those moments together is is what's what's magical. I mean, you know, sometimes it's not even just like the end product of the movie, but the experience of making it and, and, and feeling those moments together. And don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm always focused, as you know, on making the best movie possible. But that doesn't mean it has to be exactly this or nothing. You know, and I think we've got a great balance of finding that stuff together. And I think the trust that we have in doing that has enabled us to like, you know, try different things. I don't know if I would have been as open to, you know, somebody else doing that in that moment. I would have been like, what is this person doing? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, OK, Shannon, who I've done a bunch of stuff with and Bruce. So we'll, 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 let's see where this goes, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, it just it just really worked. Listen, for me as an actor, I can tell you that I've had a couple of really like raw moments. You know, I mean, you hope that all of them come across as like raw, honest moments, but personally, very raw, honest moments that are captured on screen. And that was one of them. The other one was in Bethany. There was one in like the second season of Charmed where, you know, I cry because Andy is dead and I'm sort of blaming myself. And that you gave was it away. I haven't even seen it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, now you've ruined uh, it. <laughs> that was like a very raw moment. So those are the moments that I always look back and I'm like, oh man, that's when I was my best. <laughs> is when I'm like the most raw and sort of broken down because there's no there's no wall, there's no pretense. You're not self conscious. You're not any of those things. You're just like in the moment. And it's something that I strive for as an actor. So we did the Bruce Willis thing, and then we did the Mel Gibson movie. Yeah, I, and I love your dynamic with Mel also. I thought, like, it was really interesting seeing you guys play off of each other and, and find you guys found moments together, too, which I, it was just fascinating for me because I'm like, wow, this is, like, insane to watch and, and be a part of and, and to be able to shepherd that. So I, it was it was really special. And I remember I called you and I was like, I want you to play this role. And I thought it was very funny because I, I'm always trying to have you play just some random thing. Know, you're like, you're a general. Movie, you're a general. general. Now you're a police chief. Um, you're I, this. You're like, you cast me into things nobody else thinks of me Ever. As. <laughs> ever. They would like put me as the wife and you're like, no, no, no. no you're no, the no, police no, you're chief. the police chief. I'm like, yeah, because I'm like your boss dog, Doherty. Yeah, you know, boss dog. Doherty. Yeah, that's that's you know, Shannon's a boss dog. She's a play played Monopoly or heads up with her one time. And, <laughs> we'll and, get into that in a minute. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we won't. Uh, no, but like you do, you put me in in roles that nobody else would normally put me in, including myself. And it turns out interesting. You know, on that one, I, I was uncomfortable playing a police chief. Yeah, that's and, why you were doing the nicotine gum. And we, right. we talked about that. So then we know? created that. I was like, yeah. I need I need yeah. something to do. I need like something in my hands, something in my yeah. mouth. Like I need something just to distract my own head from telling myself, why are you playing Wait, a but, police chief? But were you more nervous about playing a police chief or were you more nervous about being against like Mel? Because, because you weren't nervous about being a... Uh, 
general, uh, a general. I was. I just didn't. I hadn't quite learned how to transfer that nervousness into I, having an action, like you know, eating on screen. Which you talked about, gum. yeah, the, the whole thing with Brad Pitt. From Oceans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. So I said to you, like, I need something to do. How about if she's a former smoker? Like, w- I wanted to chew gum, and then you yeah. came up with the nicotine. The thing. nicotine. You were like, yeah. Okay. I was like, you have to have a reason why you're chewing gum, and then I'm like, okay, maybe the stress level is like here, and then you know, you have that thing of like, okay, well, maybe you know, maybe it gets too much, and you want to go smoke, and like, there's that, like, you know, we were creating the layers and the backstory of that instead of just being like, yeah, she's just chewing gum. Like, right. why is she chewing gum? You and know, it's, it's stuff that people don't necessarily see on they screen, don't see but it it's at all. but it's that stuff that you like embody and, yes. and informs the decisions and the moments and the this and that 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 you know it's a living breathing thing it's a living breathing character and i think that kind of you know was fun to do well you know it's very reminiscent of when i was younger i studied with this acting coach jeff Corey. he used to be an actor he was a big character actor he was an amazing acting coach and he lived here in malibu i didn't even live in malibu at the time but my mom would drive me and he would always have me do an entire backstory so Let's say you picked up on my character when she was, you know, 26 years old. Well, he would make me create her from the time of birth up until 26 so that well, that's the character yeah. was super layered. And I still do that to this day. It's important because the story only exists as a microcosm, you know, of, of who the person is. So it's like, you know, you, you have that brief moment of, of knowing this person in, in, in a story, but they have all this life before it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important as an actor and director to be on the same page of what that life was, you know, because d- people in life make decisions based upon previous experience. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you had, you know, a bad situation with, you know, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a lover, you're going to be more afraid of ha- being in love. Right. Right. If you if you had, you know, if you made the wrong mistake as a police chief and it got somebody killed, you're going to be, you know, afraid of making decisions that might hurt somebody. Yes. But if but if we don't layer that and have those conversations and find that that's not in the script, then you're just going not you, but people are just going like, oh, well, I just do that because I do that. You know, so finding the intention together is, I think, part of the magic of of making a movie with an actor. I agree. But I do like that you let the actors find their way and bring their a little bit of their own sense. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. What, what I like to do is, you know, I like to imagine every character. is like a blank canvas and we take our ideas about the character and we throw them at the canvas and whatever like sticks for both of us. We use to paint the picture of who that person is. Right. And I think like that's kind of, you know, the way I look at it. And and the more the actor brings to the table, the more excited they are about it. And mm-hmm. I like to build off of what they're saying and, and find that. And of course, I'll bring my ideas too, but I like to hear where their thoughts are. Because a lot of the times our thoughts, especially about characters, subconsciously, we're relating it to moments within our own life. Right. And so, you know, we look at a character, we project our own life onto it and draw meaning from there. Yeah. And so I think it's it's interesting to see that because then you can understand somebody's thought process so what was that like i mean mel gibson directed braveheart yeah one of my favorite movies of all time there's not a soul that can dispute what an amazing movie that was and what a phenomenal job he did yes as an actor but as a director right mostly i talked to him about apocalypto because i I loved that right i I mean yes fascinated by making a movie in a dead language and that's got to be a lot of pressure it was and it wasn't. The funniest thing is the first time I meet him, he sits down and he's like, all right, how do we make our, my character a little funnier? And me and him go through the script and start changing his dialogue together. And I was like, this reminds me of working with Shannon. And, uh, and so, you know, it was it was fun. You know, the fact that he'll shoot me text messages and ask how you're doing still to this day. You know, he likes to check in about you and see how you are. And, you know, like he doesn't have to do that. I no. mean, you know, how many people have we worked with that don't do that?
One of the best shows of the year, according to Apple, Amazon and Time, is back for another round. We have more insightful conversations between myself, Paul Muldoon, and Paul McCartney about... And I am Jeff Garland. Yes, you are. And we are the hosts of the History of Curb Your Enthusiasm podcast. We're going to watch every single episode. It's 122, including the pilot. And we're going to break them down. And by the way, most of these episodes I have not seen for 20 years. Yeah, me too. We're going to have guest stars and people that are very important to the show, like Larry David. I did once try and stop a, w- a woman who was about to get hit by a car. I screamed out, watch out. And she said, don't you tell me what to do. And Cheryl Hines. Why, why can't you just uh, lighten up and, and have a good time? And Richard Lewis. How am I going to tell him I'm going to leave now? Can you do it on the phone? Do you have to do it in person? What's Not the deal? Not potentially in cable. You have to go and he's a human being. He's helped you. And then we're going to have behind-the-scenes information. Tidbits. Yes, tidbits <laughs> is a great word. Anyway, we're both a wealth of knowledge about this show because we've been doing it for 23 years. So subscribe now and you could listen to the History of Curb Enthusiasm on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you happen to get your podcasts. So Puerto Rico with Bruce Willis, yeah. New Mexico with Mel, and then Los Angeles, and then with Los Van Angeles with Van yeah. Damme. Yeah, and you, you know, you work with like what I regard like movie stars, right? They're like our older guard of movie stars, which I also love. And you're constantly being like, "I want to work with this one and this one," and I'm like, "That's so awesome!" Because you're not necessarily, you know, chasing like the trend. I mean, for me. I grew up watching all these people in movies. So like I get really excited about working with people that like I learned about filmmaking from watching movies. So I got excited to like I watched, you know, I watched Lethal Weapon and I watched Die Hard and I watched, you know, um, uh, Kickboxer and all these movies when I was a kid. And I was like, I want to make movies and I'm going to work with those people when I get older. Like when I make a movie, I'm going to work with those people. You know, and so like that was like really exciting because like I'm like sitting behind monitor watching a movie at, on the screen and I'm like, holy shit, this is my movie. <laughs> I'm doing the thing I said. Yeah. So it's like it's you know, it's like I'm a little I'm a kid in a candy store. I got to work with the the people that like inspired me to want to make movies. You know? And you got started because your dad was in the business. Well, I wouldn't right? say I got started because, because of, of that. Him. I think I, I gravitated towards it. But like my dad never like hired me or made right, introductions or gave me a job. But I, I grew a passion for it because, you know, he like he was a writer and, and I was very passionate about film. And when he got very sick when I was uh, uh, younger and he was like bedridden, he was having liver failure at the time. And, you know, before that, he was like my baseball coach, all this stuff. But all we could do was like watch movies. And so we would watch movies and he would like pause the movie and ask me questions about it. And he'd like throw on stuff like, you know, the Maltese Falcon. And then like, you know, he'd, you know, be like, why is Humphrey Bogart's hand shaking? You know, he'd pause the movie and ask me. And I'm like, at the time, I thought he was just, you know, trying to make sure I was paying attention. I was like a little kid. But then I started to realize, no, he was trying to get me to analyze why an actor's doing a certain thing, why a camera's moving a certain way, what's actually going on beyond what, like the surface level of the movie. And I think that was really, you know, special. Um, so, you know, I guess that was my film school. But I also was the kid that would like make short films uh, about why I didn't want to do the book report instead of doing the book <laughs> of course because I was like nah I don't need that you know I remember my mom was telling me a story where she was like uh, you know I was I was failing out of uh, chemistry and she was like you know you're gonna fail out of chemistry and I was like mom don't worry about it I'm not gonna need chemistry when I'm making movies you were that <laughs> confident I was I, I was yeah, hell in high water oh yeah exactly I'm I, I'm failing upwards. <laughs> 
But yeah, no, you are that guy that's, you know, truly a workaholic. Like you, I think you're the happiest when you're prepping and then on a movie set. It's where I feel like the most me. If that makes sense. But I mean, I feel like you feel the most you when you're working too. I definitely you, you, do. You definitely are not the type that can sit like idle. You, you, I mean, look, you're doing a podcast. You're like, I'm, I got, I'm doing something. Yeah. You're like, you, you're always doing something. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think sitting idle just gives me too much time to examine and examine and examine. And then there's nothing good is going to come out of that well, <laughs> at the end of the day. We've all trained. We both trained our, our minds to be analytical. And mm-hmm. so if we spend too much time with nothing to analyze, we're going to analyze ourselves. <laughs> so it's like, no, nah, don't do that. Let me and do I already stuff. analyze myself to yeah. a certain degree. Like I'm pretty, I'm pretty hard on myself. So if yeah. I have too much time to really, really, really do it, I feel like you're going to curl up into a fetal sometimes. position. You're too hard on yourself sometimes. That's why I've always, I've always said that, you know, if you're going to be your, your toughest critic, you also got to be your biggest cheerleader. You know, you got to, like you're amazing. You've done so many amazing things, and you know every time me and you talk, you know I'm I, I just want to remind you of that. Like we touched on it briefly in the beginning, but like we have this amazing relationship of working together. And the first time I was going to work with you, I was warned about you being difficult, and you right. you weren't. You know, yeah. You I know? mean, I think that's still there, right? So yeah. maybe, maybe that's probably why I'm so hard on myself, and I I I definitely have not gotten the whole cheerleading part down. Like being my own cheerleader has been uh, a tough one for me that I have not mastered. And yeah, you know, you hear a story and I, and I hear this from a lot of people or I used to hear it from a lot of people um, of, oh, I was warned about you and I was told that you're difficult or you're this. And it's so hard for me to realize that there's a whole like narrative and agenda that's out there about me that has almost nothing to do with me no, it's not you at all and I, I mean that must be hard to deal with as you know i'm pretty sensitive and i tend to take a lot of things personal and it hurts me when it hurts me knowing that someone said to you that i'm difficult it hurts me that there's you know something out there about me that is not true or isn't a hundred percent of the truth or there's you know two sides to every story there's this there's that you know, I dealt with it this morning. Like I was in a super bad mood today, as you know. No, I, I remember when I got here. Yeah, because there are, you know, people who they they want the answers from me on this podcast. They want me to be clear about things, but then they don't actually want the truth. They That didn't fit into like their idea of what the truth should be. I'm getting better. Like the older I get, and I think also cancer has really changed my perspective because now I'm, I'm a lot more like, Oh my God, like life is way too short and I can't worry about like the random 10 people that, that are pissed that I'm saying something. I've got to worry about like, am I being honest to me? But when you got told like, Oof, you know, just warning you, like she's really difficult. Then I pushed you down the stairs. And then you pushed me down the stairs. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm t- just to show no. me yeah, just who to was show boss. You. But you still went forward with working with me. I mean, I was 21. I mean, yeah. So I was, you know, I was like, hey, I'll risk it. Um, <laughs> but, you know. I'm throwing I, I, the dice. Yeah, I'm, I'm rolling the dice. Um, but, you know, I mean, it must be, it must be difficult living in that shadow, especially because, like, regardless of, you know, whether it's true or not, any of these events happened so long, like a lifetime ago yeah. at this point. So like, it's, it's really, I think, sad to deal with, you know, because you're such a kind, creative, loving person and you're a creative powerhouse and, Thank and, you. and really like, you know, able to tap into raw emotion and, and really you give it your all. And so the fact that anybody would, would question whether they should work with you over something that happened so long ago is, 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 is foolish. It's crazy. I mean, you know, I have my own opinions. I don't think you did any of those things, but, but regardless, it's, it's even if, even if it did, it's so long ago that it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, listen, there's definitely some that I did like, absolutely. I take full accountability for anything that I did, but you're right. Like, I'm sorry how can a woman be persecuted for something she did when she was 20 years old? 
you know, like, and that it definitely followed me or when I was 18, it followed me my, uh, you know, my entire career. And it, by the way, it still follows me to this day. You know, working together and stuff like we've been working together during your cancer and, and, and so many people you've had to voice that you are still happy to work and able to work Yeah, because people write off, you know, oh, she has cancer. She's this, she can't, you know, she can't do it. And I mean, you can, you, you, it's, if anything, you're more in touch your, with your emotions. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's very, it's a weird experience to have people reach out to me, you know, when we're so close and have, and, and I feel like almost publicly so close, you know, and have people ask me, you if know, we're dating. No, no, not if we're, well, <laughs> that too. Cause that we too. get asked that all the time. Yeah. But, re but regardless, I, I think the, the funniest, <laughs> the funniest it's thing. It's official. I'm a it's cougar. A, it's a, yeah, there you go. It's, it's, it's robbing the cradle. <laughs> um, but I think the, 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 the thing that's difficult to deal with is, is having people reach out and say like, you know, is she, either is she able to work i'll get those questions or like stuff like you know like what she like to deal with and, right. and like if i'm getting those questions like what what are you dealing with and or are you not even getting those questions because like they don't even have the guts to talk to you so i'm not like, even getting those even questions get, exactly so yeah. you're not even there to defend yourself in these rooms which is i think you know an unfair thing because you know you're able to work and you're easy to work hundred percent. It was also like a different day and age, right? When I had, when I got that reputation, when I first supposedly earned it, like earned in quotation marks, um, it was a different day and age. Like women weren't allowed to speak out. Yeah. And it's, I, I feel like you've been a casualty of that because look at how has nobody supported you as, as all of these women's rights things have been pushed now, you know, at, at like so much further, you were an opinionated, you know, woman who who was working very hard who was gaining fame and like you know i understand how somebody could be threatened you know in, in in that regard like somebody who's insecure if you came to them and were like hey what do you think i try this or this with the character they might be like super threatened by that right you know like so i understand but it's it's part of the collaborative process that's that's all their problem not your problem you know what i mean and i think that's i think it's unfair that that has not been reversed you know and, and people aren't going like wow wait we need to actually cut S shannon some slack here and and think about that i think it's it's a really unfair situation thanks i'm over it <laughs> you're like i'm you're so like, yeah. over it i mean yeah. i just like you know i've i've been i've been chasing that for so long that like reputation and trying to prove myself um, that eventually I think you just go, why? Like, what am I doing? I mean, and what is it all for? That's a healthy response though. Like you, you shouldn't have to prove yourself. Listen, to that might not all be true if it weren't, you know, like I get to still be creative as an actor and go on to sets because I get to work with you, you know, like you've literally one of the few people that have hired me over the last 11 years right like there's been a few kevin smith like you know i did the heathers reboot there are some but you have consistently like hired rehired hired rehired me almost to the point where i wonder if you regret it because now i call you and i'm like oh i hear you're doing another movie <laughs> uh, no 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 you was go. my part in it no no no. like no, the latest go. one that i'm not gonna say who's in it and i was like there better be a part for me james no <laughs> the latest one and, you, and when you read you read the script and you go you go yeah, there's not a good enough part for me you don't want to do this one <laughs> <laughs> you've said that to me well i've said yeah i can't do this one there's not a good enough part for shannon in this and I'm like, oh, I can find one. You can find one. You're like, Just write I'm, it. I'm going to play every role. Just write it bigger. <laughs> make it bigger. You're yeah. like, but it doesn't make sense. I'm like, you can do it, James. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't actually call me and tell me not to do a movie. I'm, I'm just... Some of this is sarcasm and take it out of context on a podcast. So I just want to be very clear. Oh, God, I can't wait for the trolls to get a hold of this. <laughs> it's so funny. Speaking of our next movie. No, I'm kidding. Uh <laughs> Sh Shannon, uh, speaking of, Ch have you ever played the game Heads Up? <gasps> so there's this game Heads Up where you, you guess things. and like on the, this. So it's on, like, you on do the phone. It on your yeah, cell phone, you yeah. turn it downwards at any time you get the thing right to, to see how many points you could rack up. So I got like a, a bazillion points on it. I did really well. 
and then Shannon had to go second. And anytime she would guess something, it would be wrong. And she'd go, no, 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 it's right. And she just, she did it. And then she goes, oh, I beat you. I had a higher point score. And I was like, all you did was go oh like God. this. You didn't even guess it's things. True. <laughs> it's so true. I am, oh my God, I'm so competitive. Yeah, she's like, but the score says I won. And I was like, you literally just went like this. <laughs> I am, I mean, my brother, like growing up playing. Sean? Sean, my brother, Sean, growing up playing um games he was like horrified to play any games with me because <laughs> i i had to win i just i had to win yeah it was like a real thing no it's it's true i'm remembering your birthday oh my when, murder when mystery the birthday. murder mystery party where i figured it out and you literally switched teams to go onto my team because you're like, oh wait, he 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 does figure it. He I does. knew he you knows. had it figured yeah, out. Yeah, so so you're like, I'm on his team now, and then you're like, I got it right. Because you were just, it was the way that you were walking around the house. Yeah, you were very confident, but you also did what everybody was supposed to do. So we had a murder mystery here at my house in Malibu for my last birthday, mm-hmm. and um, everybody got divided into teams, and so you're supposed to go up and ask each group questions and then the questions give you clues yeah and james was doing that i was i don't know i guess i just thought that i could figure it out without even asking anybody anything Uh, (laughs) you forgot the assignment i forgot the assignment (laughs) i was socializing and you know but then i saw james stop talking to everybody and he just he had this like little smirk on his face (laughs) and i knew in that instant that he had it all figured out and so, yeah, I went to him. I was like, James, it's my birthday. It's I'm my birthday. <laughs> I want to know the answer right now. <laughs> and he told me and we won. Yeah, we did. We did. No, no thanks to me. No, I told her and Shannon, <laughs> instead, <laughs> Shannon, instead of winning, then went around telling everybody what it was and said that she'd <laughs> figured it out. So everyone I won. I did not do everyone that. Everyone won. Everyone won. No, uh, Remember, everybody it was, guessed no, it. it was Adam, Dana, and I that got the oh. the little certificates. That right, said that right. We I won. didn't get this. Oh, right. You, oh, you just stole my thing. You did, I didn't win. Yeah, you didn't win. My team won. How did I not win? I don't know. I think you said that you didn't care. Oh, yeah. I, I remember care. you being like, I don't care. Just take it and give it to your team. And I was like, oh. And I felt bad for your team member. It was your brother. <laughs> it was my brother. <laughs> it was your brother. I was on with Sean and Nan. Oh my God, Uh, that's hysterical. (laughs) But it was fun. It was like something different to do. It was fun. So I'm curious, like, because, you know, you and I obviously have been friends for 11 years and we've been through a lot together Mm -hmm. and cancer. Like, how was that? You know, because I, because I know that it's as hard as it is on me. It's also extremely hard on the other people in my life. You know, it's, uh, it's, I get asked about it a lot. Um, Everybody asks me for like updates of how you are and stuff and, it's one of those things of like, sometimes I feel, because we don't really talk about it. No. I mean, that's like, but I feel like we don't talk about it, not because I don't want to know about it, but because I feel like because I don't see you on a daily basis, when we see each other, like I'm kind of your escape from dealing with it. You're dealing with this diagnosis at all times. And so like, I try to not make our time together about that. Yeah. Because I feel like you need that time away from that. It wasn't that long ago after like one of my infusions and I get really sick after the infusions Yeah. for like a couple of days. Um, and you came over, you were like, listen, we don't have to talk about it. I'm just going to come over. You can sleep on the couch. I'm just going to sit next to you, watch TV. And you did. And it was actually, it was really nice because it was like, there was, again, there was no conversation about it. You were just there and you didn't recoil in horror when I threw up, like you were okay with it. We watched Jury Duty, and I, yes. uh, and I kept giving you saltines, which mm-hmm. you were very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, obviously, I care about what's going on with you, and, you know, it's it's a lot, and, and you're so brave, and you're dealing with so much. But, you know, everybody around you is talking to you about that, you know, and I just feel like, you know, if you wanted to talk to me about it, you'd, you'd call me and talk to me. I also think that like we have a sort of bond and a mutual camaraderie because we both lost our fathers. Yeah. And you were, like me, extremely close with your dad. We lost our fathers for the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Both, you know, kidney dialysis. Yeah. 
you lost your father like right before we met, right? I think so. And then I lost my dad four years ago. And I remember we were talking. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about that stuff too. We we dealt with that. (laughs) We did. We did. I also, I just think that anybody who, I don't know, your relationship with your parents, like I love that. I have a deep love and respect for someone who cares so deeply for their own family. To touch on the cancer thing, one thing that is hard because we don't talk about it is it's very hard seeing the updates of how you're doing in like tabloids <laughs> versus hearing about it from you. Because anytime something comes out. But I always like, yeah. but but that's just, you know, it's a regurgitation of, course. of something yeah. that, you know, I've said three months prior or six months prior. It's, you know, them just putting a new spin on it. Right. Or somebody selling a story or whatever. But, but the, like the weirdest thing about that is when that happens, whenever a story comes out, like the people want any of the things that come out, people don't like text me and say, hey, how's Shannon doing? Everybody just sends I'll get like 40 people that just send me the article as if I haven't seen it before. You know, my brother got the same thing, like a bunch of people sending him the article and then like calling him. And I was like, Sean, it's. It's what I told you about, you know, when we were in, when we were in Texas. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, so, uh, you know, someone who has cared for a loved one that was sick, like, what are the challenges in that for you or that were there for you? And how, how has that impacted you? And maybe it hasn't like, did it impact you in the way that you deal with people? Has it impacted on a personal level? Has it impacted your work at all? I mean, I think that it's definitely impacted my work. As, as you know, when you lose somebody that you love, there's a piece of you that dies, dies. with them. Yep. Yeah. And, it, and it's and it's gone, you know, and, and you know, that pain exists and, and it never goes away mm-hmm. because it's the reminder of who they were, and how important they were to you. Like, I mean, I, I find myself still randomly hearing a song that will make me cry and I'll think about my dad. And it's overwhelming to deal with. And it's that piece of you is missing. And, you know, there's when every something exciting happens, you want to call and talk to them. When something you know sad happens, you want to call and talk to them and you can't. And it's hard to have real conversations with people, though I never wish this upon them, of them losing somebody they love like that. It's hard to really relate on some levels with a lot of people that don't understand what you're actually going through and, and, and what that is. You know, I think... I dealt with a lot when my dad was sick because I was like his medical proxy. Like I made all of his medical decisions because he was not able to do that himself in the last year. When and so like I had to make all those decisions and I had to be the one to like tell them to take him off of the life support and and sign the you know the do not resuscitate and all that stuff. And and you know the the weirdest thing about that is even though all these doctors tell you it's the right thing to do and you do that and then you know you still like have this feeling of like, did I, did I kill them? Did I, did the choices I made kill them? If I had held out a, a month longer, would they have recovered? Like, did I murder the person that I love? And I know that's like a, a weird thought process to have, but because you have that responsibility and you took that responsibility, it's hard not to, to think like that. Yeah. That's definitely affected it. And, uh, and, and also just, you know, like, I don't want the pain of losing my dad to go away because it shows me how important he was to me. It's not a pain of always, like I'm not in agony as I walk down the street, but things remind me of him and I will feel that sadness. And, and I think that it's important. And It's almost honoring them yeah. and honoring the relationship that you have and how much you loved them. It's, it's like, you know, I miss my dad every single second of the day. I don't cry every single day anymore, but yeah, I miss him. And and there are moments when I hear a song or, you know, a certain food is being cooked or there's something that, you know, a a, a joke. And I can see my dad like (laughs) laughing so hard that tears would pour down his face. Right. Because that's, that was his kind of laughter. And that's what gets me. That's what like those painful moments. But like you said, it's not, consistently like that you're in agony but it just again shows like your love and your relationship with your father and how important that was 
So how, how has that impacted maybe you and your work? Well, it's impacted me, as you know, um, because I, I used to write all the stuff that I directed mm -hmm. and I stopped writing um, because the last thing that I was writing, I was writing with him and he made me promise I would finish it uh, if he died. And he died and I have still not finished it because, you know, sitting and finishing that, I've sat like in front of the, the keyboard to finish it and it's just like, I'm not ready to finish it, you know? And it's so silly because it was not even like, it's just a, like a cheesy horror movie. It was not a deep project. Like I want it to be deep now because. But of you only, your promise to him was that you would finish it. It wasn't that you wouldn't write anything else. It was just that you would finish that. Yeah, I know. But it's like, that. Uh, it's hard for me to not. I understand. You know. But maybe, just maybe, this is not the first time I've had this conversation with you. <laughs> yeah, no, but now we're doing it on a podcast. I'm going to do it on a podcast to give some extra pressure here. Maybe, just maybe, if you write something else, it will free you up to finish what you two started together. Maybe. I just want to say to you that on a professional level, I always really love working with you. I think that you're, you know, very giving. I think that you're very talented. And on a personal level, I, you know, deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate how much you have you know, supported me. And I'm not talking about career. I'm talking about like going through cancer and going through divorce and heartbreak and, you know, making me laugh, calling me drunk at 1 a.m., asking me to marry you. <laughs> what? Um, sorry, that goes both ways. <laughs> that goes it. both that goes both ways. Had you have called it. me drunk before and asked me to marry you. Have I? Yes. I have never drunk dog anybody in my life. You are a liar. Um, You're gonna put this in <laughs> But the other thing I am gonna say is that you just like you promised your dad, you have promised that I would write you a script. I know, I know, I know, I know. And I did say it, it has to be before I die. This is a whole podcast. So you gotta get on it. This is a whole podcast. We just have to figure out if it's like a hardcore drama or if we're doing like an old lady John Wick. I've is, already kind of figured out what I... Is it more like the old lady John Wick? That's what you want it to be, but it's going to be a hardcore drama that has an old lady John Wick thing going on in it. I'm sure it's going to be brilliant. And we're going to talk about it, but I had this really, like on the drive out here, I had this really cool idea. Ooh. Um, so we'll talk about it. So I can expect to see it on my desk in 10 days? What? <laughs> <laughs> 10 days what also what desk what <laughs> that one over that there one, the one that you use for video games <laughs> you mean your game desk i don't game anymore i gave it all up you gave it all up you, oh wow it sounds like you're a drug I started addict podcasting i gave it all instead. up i gave it all up i'm no longer on the game Listen, sauce, that James. was like a very good covid <laughs> distraction yeah. right people were making learning how to make sourdough bread and i was learning how to game because you already knew how to make sourdough bread yeah, yes, <laughs> but I didn't want to learn any more cooking skills. I simply wanted to learn how to be the ultimate gamer. Yeah. I did come up short. I'm not the ultimate gamer. I, no. It takes like a 13-year-old. Yeah. Like, those kids are so good at that. But I feel like you kind of, like, I remember there was there was times where, like, we were hanging out, and you were, you were like, <laughs> looking at your phone, and I'm like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, I'm just looking at, like, you know, the, the stats on my game from, like, over here. And you're like, I, I might need to leave. I might need to go back and, 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 and like up these stats on this. And I'm like, are, are you serious right now, Shannon? <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, when I commit, I commit. Okay. I I'm 100% yeah. committed to uh, everything that I do. But mainly my uh, friendship with you. I love you I love very you. much. And thanks for driving to Malibu. Are you're you welcome. ready for some pizza? Let's have some pizza. All right. Let's get to it, you guys. Thank you, you for Shannon. listening to Let's Be Clear with Shannon Doherty. And uh, we're going to go cook some pizza now. Bye. Bye. Bye.